Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Update, the 31st of January. Can't believe the year has gone so fast already. Hope everyone has had a good week. As always, we have the chapters. You can jump to any particular update you care about the most. New videos this week. It's been kind of a hectic week, but I managed to get the resiliency module of the Azure Masterclass updated. So really, this is just that continuation of trying to get the whole masterclass updated over the, the first few months of this year. So on to what's new on the compute side. So Azure Reservations let us lock in a discount for a specific use of a specific SKU in a specific region for a one or a three year period. So it's pretty specific. But when I do an Azure reservation for virtual machines, I get to choose between optimizing for instant size flexibility or the capacity priority. Now, if I pick the instant size flexibility, you get the discount applied for various sizes within the SKU. And each size has a certain ratio of use based on its footprint in terms of CPU and memory. Now, for the M series, those ratios have been updated as of December 6. So you just want to go and check your coverage, uh, your use. There is a spreadsheet that shows the old and new. So if we jump over to the spreadsheet super quick, we can go and see. And it's kind of showing you the new and the old ratio um, if it's been impacted at all. So, hey, it's changed here. So you just want to go down and just look and see, hey, what is that new auto fit ratio? And has that really impacted in any significant way your reservations? And you just maybe now would need a bigger reservation potentially, or maybe you're not using all of the reservation. So you just wanna go uh, and be aware of what those changes are. Azure Red Hat OpenShift is now available in Spain Central. So this is the jointly operated offering by Microsoft and Red Hat. So now if I leverage Spain Central, it is available locally there. Azure Dev Test Labs now has hibernation support in preview. So the hibernation is really nice. It's just like your regular PC. When I sleep the PC, it still uses quite a lot of power because it keeps the, the memory, the processor active. When I hibernate, it actually shuts down the computer and it saves the memory, it saves the device state to disk. So in Azure, hibernate works the same way. It's gonna take the memory and the device state saves it to your storage. So I stop paying the compute charges for that virtual machine. I just carry on paying for the disk. This is really nice that I now don't lose the state of the virtual machine, like what processes are running, which I do if I just shut the thing down. So this will be really useful in a lab environment if I have something that takes a really long time to start up or it's a really complex process. So now this does apply to my dev test labs environment. Remember dev test labs is really good for creating and managing those IaaS virtual machines that I may use in my lab environments. Additionally, for Azure dev test labs, it now supports the gen two virtual machines. Remember gen one it is BIOS based, so you get certain limitations there. Whereas the gen two is UEFI based. So that means I get a virtual TPM. That means I can get things like secure boot. I can take advantage if I'm using the right skew of things like Intel SGX, high performance capabilities. So now we have that option in our Azure Dev Test Labs as well. And then the VM performance diagnostics have been enhanced. And this is again in preview. So via the VM overview monitoring tab or the VM insights blade of Azure Monitor, I now get insight into the ability to diagnose performance issues. Now I can use this in an on-demand capacity, or I can set it to a continuous mode where every five seconds, it will go and collect the key performance usage. I think that's Windows only today. It's gonna to go and store that data in a storage account. So I can configure it via the help performance diagnostics on the VM properties. And also I get a bunch of new reports. So it's just a really nice capability to help me diagnose performance problems uh, with my virtual machines. On the networking side, so App Gateway has increased the number of custom error pages available. Remember App Gateway is that layer seven uh, set of balancing capabilities within the region. So before I could do 403, which is forbidden, and 502 bad gateway, and I could customize those error pages. What they've done is they've added support for 400, 405, 408, 500, 503, and 504. 
So that's things like bad requests, request timeout, service unavailable, and more. So now I can set custom pages globally for my whole App Gateway instance or for specific listeners. So I just get greater capabilities there. On the storage side, so there are some new Azure Data Box devices available in Preview. Azure Data Box we use for offline data migrations between my data center and the Azure data centers. This will be really useful if I just had a huge data migration or I just don't have a very good network connection between my location and Azure and there's too much data or I need it done in a time frame that I cannot do over the network or I don't have the spare network capacity available because I'm using it for my various production things. So we now have these new Azure Data Box 120 and 525 boxes. They're NVMe based, and as the name suggests, they come in 120 terabyte and 525 terabyte versions. Obviously, being NVMe, it gives really high speed transfers, very high reliability. And it's also, if I use SMB Direct on RDMA, which is these 100 gigabit Ethernet connections, I get copy speeds up to 7 gigabytes per second, which is crazy speeds. Um, they're fairly small form factor, so they ship next day in most regions. They're encrypted at rest with BitLocker, and what's going to come is, in addition, I could do hardware encryption, and they're really built to be rugged, so they can handle the rough shipping conditions. That shouldn't be any kind of issue uh, with using those. On the database side, and you're going to see this time and time again, if you're using Azure HD Insight, you need to get to TLS 1.2 and above before end of March, 2025. Basically TLS 1.1 and 1.0, anything below that is being retired. So you need to make sure whatever your client connecting to your Azure HD Insight is, is capable of TLS 1.2 or it's not gonna be able to establish uh, that secure connection. Um, SQL Hyperscale, now has database shrink capabilities. Remember, SQL Hyperscale separates the compute from the page server, so I can get this mash see of both performance and capacity set of capabilities. So what Shrink lets me do is reclaim unused space within the database. So that's going to optimize my space use and therefore reduce my storage costs. So now this capability of shrinking is part of the Hyperscale tier as well. And it just uses the regular... Uh, DBCC shrink database and DBCC shrink file commands via T-SQL. So you don't have to have any special knowledge or anything else. Uh, I can just go and take advantage of that. Miscellaneous, another TLS. So this was communicated back at the beginning of March 2024 that TLS 1.0 and 1.1 have been removed. So you basically just, again, ARM is the Azure control plane. So any interactions, be it portal or CLI or PowerShell or REST, you name it, if I'm doing some operation for the resources in Azure, I'm going via the Azure control plane, which is ARM. So anything that wants to talk to that control plane, you have to be able to speak TLS 1.2 um, by the beginning of March, 2025. Azure Key Vault Premium is now available in the China cloud. So that's the Mooncake cloud. Azure Key Vault Premium, remember, provides FIPS 140 Level 3 hardware security modules. So that's the highest level of security, adherence to the highest levels of standards. So that's going to be really useful when I just need that absolute highest level, or maybe I've got certain compliance requirements I have to adhere to. <laughs> DeepSeek, I think we've probably all heard about DeepSeek this week. So DeepSeek R1 is now available in the Azure AI Foundry. Remember, Azure AI Foundry, we hear a lot about Microsoft's partnership with OpenAI, but there's thousands of different models in Azure AI Foundry. Some we use via serverless consumption-based endpoints. Some they're going to deploy into a managed virtual machine. But now DeepSeek R1 is available as part of the Azure AI Foundry and also the GitHub uh, model exploration. And it is available via a serverless endpoint. So I'm only going to, I think once it's more, uh, generally available, I think it's actually free at the time of recording, but we're going to pay for the interactions, the tokens I use, and there is no base infrastructure from a VM I have to worry about. I deploy my instance, I get my inference API, my key, and I, I'm good to go. Also, the Entra PowerShell module has gone GA. Now, you're probably going to maybe scratch your head a little bit on this. I did do a video on the Entra PowerShell module. We used to have the Azure AD 
PowerShell modules and preview PowerShell modules and the MS Online PowerShell modules, they were all deprecated along with the endpoints they used to use to talk to Azure AD. Instead, the focus is on the Microsoft Graph and the Microsoft Graph PowerShell module. The challenge was people who used to use the Azure AD module did not like the Microsoft Graph PowerShell module because they weren't very intuitive. They weren't focused around the scenarios necessarily of dealing with the things for a user or a group or a device. And so what the Entra PowerShell module does is it still sits on top of Graph, but it behaves in a consistent behavior of the Azure AD module and is backwards compatible with it. So it's much easier to use for my management of users, groups, apps, service principles, because it's really focused on those types of scenarios. And that was it. Uh, as always, I hope that was useful. Until next video, take care.